welcome everyone uh, to this webinar. I'm Rafael Carmona from the ICDR. And I know we're all very eager to hear from our panelists. So I will just be very quick to mention that you can join uh, ICDR uh, Young and International as a YNI associate. If you go to our website, you can look for ICDR Young and International. In our website, you'll find registration forms in English and in Spanish, as well as recordings from pre previous webinars. Uh, we're also in LinkedIn. We have a LinkedIn group. Again, if you look for ICDR Young and International, you're going to find us and uh, you can request to join. We'll be posting also all of our updates there. Uh, with that, I want to also thank the panelists, um, the moderators, as well as uh, Greta Walters from our uh, YNI Executive Board for organizing this event. And I give the floor to our first moderator, Marcel. Marcel, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, Rafa. Uh, thank you, Greta and ICDR Young and International for uh, organizing this event and for the party. A very kind invitation uh, for me to moderate the panel uh, with such an interesting topic and, um, and uh, roster of panelists. Um, the law applicable to the arbitration agreement is one of those topics that we have been um, studying and discussing for years and each new development and new case just really adds fuel to the discussion rather than solving anything. It just makes it that much more fun for us practitioners and uh, researchers. Uh, but I know you wanna hear from the panelists rather than from me. So let me just briefly introduce them even though they don't need any introductions. Uh, first up, we have Professor Maxi Scherer, who will give us uh, an overview of the topic as a way of introduction to the debates. Uh, professor Scherer is a special counsel at Wilmer Hale in London and a professor of law at the School of International Arbitration at Queen Mary University. She has practiced international arbitration for more than 20 years and represented clients, served as arbitrator or legal expert in more than 120 commercial and investor state arbitrations. She is the vice president of the LCIA and holds many other public appointments and commissions of trust, including being a member of the ICSID panel of arbitrators. Second, we hear from uh, Professor Patricia Shaughnessy, who will discuss when and whether the law of the seat should be applicable to uh, uh, the arbitration agreement. Uh, Professor Shaughnessy researches and teaches at Stockholm University, where she created the Master of International Commercial Arbitration Law Program. She is a member of the ICC Court of Arbitration, and until 2019, she was the vice chair and member of the Board of the Arbitration Institute of the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce, as well as serving on other boards, task forces, and committees. She serves as an arbitrator expert and as consultant has led legal development projects in a number of countries. And last but certainly not least, Joseph Schwartz uh, will discuss whether the law of the contract should apply to the arbitration agreement. Uh, Joseph Schwartz is a partner at Wagner Arbitration in Berlin. He serves as party counsel and arbitrator to parties and clients around the world. His experience includes proceedings administered by the ICC, DIS, SEC, DIA, GMAA, and many other institutions, as well as ancestral ad hoc arbitrations, as so and party appointed arbitrator, lead counsel, and secretary. Uh, Joseph holds a doctorate degree from Humboldt University of Berlin and coordinates the German arbitration institutions under 40 chapter also in Berlin. So I'll now give the floor to Professor Scherer. Um, to the audience, feel free to ask questions in the Q&A function throughout the panel, and I'll pose them to the panelists towards the end. Um, so without further ado, Professor Scherer, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marcel. Thanks for the kind words of introduction. It's always a pleasure to be at a, a young uh, ICDR event. Um, one part of my CV that uh, many of you won't know is that I actually was part of the ICDR YNI executive board about 150,000 years ago. Um, at least that's how it feels. <laughs> so it's it's a pleasure to to be back. So my uh, role here is to give a couple of introductory remarks to set the scene on um, the question of uh, the law governing the arbitration agreement. And I am going to start by telling you that there is actually no such thing than the law governing the arbitration agreement. And that is because there are potentially several laws that govern questions relating to the arbitration agreement. And it, it is very important that before asking the question of the governing law, that you actually properly phrase um, the debate and ask yourself, what is it really that we want to uh, look at? For instance, there are cases where one party argues that there was a form of duress 
so that actually its consent to the arbitration agreement uh, was not properly made. These, of course, are questions relating the substantive validity of the arbitration agreement. And then there are cases where we need to look at the form requirements, whether or not an arbitration agreement could be um, entered into orally, or if there has to be some uh, something in writing or any whatever other form, uh, I don't know, signature in red ink or so um, uh, for the arbitration agreement. These are questions of the formal validity of the arbitration agreement. Then you have questions regarding what did the parties actually want to say when they used this or that terminology in the arbitration agreement, questions of interpretation of the arbitration agreement. And then you have also uh, other sets of questions regarding um, the scope and the effect of the arbitration agreement, for instance, uh, whether or not it extends to non-signatories, an assignee, for instance, or insurer of one of the parties that signed the arbitration agreement. I could go on like this for quite some time because there are a lot of sub questions um, to relating to the arbitration agreement. Uh, Gary Bourne's treatise, which is somewhere behind me um, on that shelf, uh, actually identifies no less than 13 sub questions uh, in relation to the arbitration agreement that could potentially be governed by different laws. And the emphasis here is obviously on could. Uh, they don't necessarily have to, um, but they could. Now, why does this matter? Let me give you uh, two examples. One example is the text um, of Article 5.1a of the New York Convention um, that we all are familiar with actually refers on its face only to the validity of the arbitration agreement. So when you do look at the text, I actually have it here on my screen, it says that the arbitration agreement um, but one of the grounds of refusing recognition and enforcement is if the arbitration agreement is not valid under the law to which the parties have subjected it to or failing any indication thereon under the law of the country where the award was made. So again, on its face, it only applies to the question of whether or not an arbitration agreement is valid. It does not apply to other questions, for instance, its effect or scope. Um, so you need to be very careful in phrasing those questions. And one of the things I'm currently doing um, as part of a empirical research that uh, I'm doing with colleagues on the Kluver arbitration base. So we look at um, the decisions, court decisions that exist on the Kluver arbitration base, actually over a thousand decisions um, on recognition, enforcement, set aside, et cetera. Um, and we look empirically at a number of questions. And one of the questions I've looked at um, together with my colleague Ole Jensen um, is actually whether or not national court provision, national courts apply Article 5.1a of the New York Convention only to the validity or potentially also to other questions. And I can give you here as a primer, this is non-published data yet, um, that exactly half of the decision we found applied only to the validity and um, the other 50% applied also to other questions. Now, the other example I want to give you why it matters to phrase the question correctly is um, in relation to the validation principle. Now, you are all aware that there are sort of four main theories when it comes to the law governing um, the arbitration agreement, the law of the seat, the law of the contract, which will be debated later on, uh, international principles, as well as the validation principle. Now, the validation principle, as you will also aware of is the idea that if an arbitration agreement is valid under, uh, let's say, the law of the seat, law A, and not valid under the law of the um, contract, uh, con uh, law B, then you would prefer the law of the seat. And the rationale is that if the parties signed and entered into an arbitration agreement, they really want to have this arbitration agreement upheld rather than invalidated. Now, that validation principle applies in different jurisdictions than Switzerland, for instance. And the underli underlying rationale is, is, makes a lot of sense. It's actually a general principle of interpretation in a lot of countries. But that validation principle has its limit. It applies to the validity of the arbitration agreement, but it's much less of use uh, or can actually be applied if you look at interpretation of an arbitration agreement or scope of an arbitration agreement. So again, it depends on the actual question asked and, and, and the, the 
difficulty of the validation principle has also been highlighted by some recent uh, decisions in the UK. The UK Supreme Court has had the opportunity twice now to actually give its, its opinion, and I'm happy to expand on that uh, if, if there are questions. Um, I'm now, my final remark, and this is a transition to uh, the next, next speakers, uh, is, uh, and now Marcel, I think we're gonna, uh, if you can share the slide, is just to look at the different options that exist um, worldwide. I, I've mentioned them sort of earlier on already, the four different main theories. And, and what we've done with uh, my colleague, and this is um, in an article that has been published, I've put it here on the slide, it's publicly available under that link, is that we've tried to look at globally what is actually the sort of trends when it comes to the law governing the arbitration agreement. And the scenario underlying this map is that the parties have chosen the law governing the contract that contains the arbitration agreement, but they have chosen a seat, but they have not chosen specifically a law governing the arbitration agreement. And in that scenario, which is frankly the most common scenario in international arbitration, um, here are the results that we have found. Um, this is not a box ticking exercise. There's actually quite a lot of analysis that goes into this, but we've come, to the result that um, some uh, sort of the green countries apply the law of the main contract, the blue countries apply the law of the seat, and then you have the validation principle or sort of parties common intent international principles in yellow. Um, and so you can see that probably the blue and the green is, is, is quite um, evenly divided. Um, of those countries that we could find solutions to gray, we haven't been able either to find sources or um, the evidence was just not um, uh, clear enough for us to find uh, the solution. 51% um, prefer the law of the seat, 34 prefer the lex contractus, 9% uh, uh, the party's common intent um, or international principles, and 6% the validation principle. So that may be just as a introduction and background from my side uh, for now Patricia and Joseph to look at in more detail what these solutions exactly are and which one we should prefer. Thank you. Thank you for that great introduction, Maxi, which I think really does um, the important setting of the stage. And I'm happy to see that on the map, there seems to be a predominant um, tug of war between the green and the blue with the blue um, prevailing, I think Maxi said 51%. And indeed, um, if one is concerned about the lack of clarity, which leads to uncertainty, then there is some attraction for going to the law of the seat because it will provide some clarity in how to resolve this. Um, it'll be relatively easy to identify a seat, even if the parties have not chosen a seat. And one can then find directly what law is going to be applicable without having to create a storm before the dispute really gets underway as to the law applicable to the arbitration agreement. Now, what ends up happening, of course, is that in situations with the law applicable to the arbitration agreement, we will have some um, controversy about the complexity, which is based on the context and the circumstances. And that's going to lead to a number of competing commentary and confusion. So all those seeds will lead us to the seat. And that um, it can, we can find, uh, admittedly, it's not a clear path. If one looks at the text, which one should, and as Maxi pointed out, if we look at the text of the New York Convention, then we find that failing the party's um, agreement on what they, which law they would subject it to or any indication they're on, then it will go to the seat. And we all find the equivalent text in the model law. Now, one could argue, and perhaps Joseph will, that that's a throwback to the territoriality idea of arbitration, which is reflected in 1958 in the New York Convention, and that today we have progressed to a more commercial oriented, stronger party autonomy, seeking to find more adapted autonomous um, 
solutions and arbitration, but yet this territory, territoriality approach does provide greater clarity and certainty in attaching a law applicable to the arbitration agreement. Because once we get away from, and again, the starting point under everywhere, I guess in, on Maxi's map, is if the parties have explicitly specifically chosen a law applicable to the arbitration agreement, that will be given effect by both seat courts and enforcing courts. The issue becomes when it is not clear and if there is some indication that the parties might have had another um, solution in mind. So the approach which Joseph will present, um, I imagine will be argued as having a greater commercial reality of what the parties who were engaging in might have thought it would lead to. The problem with that is, and the reason why countries such as Sweden, who has actually taken the approach into a specific legislative provision in the Arbitration Act, providing for failing such an agreement by the party, it's going to be the seat. The reason is, is that it is going to provide perhaps a level of formality, legal formalism over seeking commercial intentions. But one must bear in mind that there is a reason why the arbitration agreement is subject to the separability principle. The arbitration agreement is a, a, a discrete and different type of clause in the, in the contract in which it's embedded. And it has significant procedural implications and significant legal implications. And it works better when it is consistent with the law of the seat, which is applying to other aspects of the procedure of the arbitration, and indeed for going into a potential setting aside um, proceedings. And the approach that we might see develop, you know, we can discuss of that we see in the in the Chubb Enka case and such of, and now in the Kebab case of having a different approach at the seat and a dip than you have at enforcement is only going to add to the confusion and complexity. And so I would argue for the seat, let me uh, quickly note as, as Maxi very well pointed out, the idea of the New York Convention, which got into the model law was to look at the um, form of validity. But indeed the Swedish case, which you can find mentioned in, in uh, Gary Bourne's book and is discussed. Um, in that case, the, the Swedish court found that the general choice of law of Austrian law did not apply. And it's reported as the validity. The interesting issue is the court was actually subject to having to determine whether or not the agreement to arbitrate implied an inherent obligation of confidentiality. And the court said in order to determine if arbitration agreements trigger confidentiality, that one first had to look at the law applicable to the arbitration agreement. And the court said, we must start then with the validity issue. So having done that, it took them all the way to the decision of saying that there is no inherent obligation of confidentiality, which does show quite clearly Maxi's um, laying out how there are complex issues attached to this. So I look to Joseph telling us why Sweden and the other members of the 51% are wrong and we're stuck in 1958. <laughs> Thank you very much, Patricia. Thank you very much, Maxi. Um, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may be located. Um, Patricia has just been a splendid advocate for applying the law of the seat to govern the arbitration agreement and now it is up to me to rebut these arguments and to explain to you why it's much more reasonable to actually apply the contractual choice of law to the arbitration agreement as well. As you know, the topic of today's event is where to go and what to do when you get there. And I do believe that when you want to know where to go, it's equally important to first know where you actually are and probably also how you've gotten there. And Maxi has earlier described and laid the ground why we are in this situation where we are. And if I may break down Maxi's explanations, one could say where we are is a situation of actual or at least perceived legal complexity and uncertainty. And why we are here is threefold. 
The first fact is that some splendid legal minds have come up with the idea that the arbitration agreement is to be regarded as a distinct agreement separable from the main contract. Secondly, despite this first fact, the parties to these arbitrations agreements regularly fail to explicitly indicate which law they would like to govern the, this distinct and separate contract. Instead, they only agree on the law applicable to the main contract, or they agree on the seat of the arbitration, or both, or none of it. And then, thirdly, there is no consensus among international courts how to uniformly interpret this mess that we're in. And that leaves us on this colorful map that Maxi has previously shown us. Now that we know where we are and why we're here, I would like to explain to you where to go. And I think answering this question isn't too complicated because we have a powerful navigation system with us. And that is the New York Convention, as Patricia also mentioned. Having regard to the stipulations of the New York Convention will not only safeguard the later enforcement, but it will also provide us with guidance in choosing the right law applicable to the arbitration agreement. And if I may direct the audience's um, attention to Article 5, Section 1A of the New York Convention, we see that this gives us the reasons why a future court may either set aside the award or refuse enforcement, something that we would like to avoid. And I quote, the parties to the agreement referred to in Article 2, which is the arbitration agreement, were under law applicable to them under some capacity. That's not what we're discussing here. And now the important part is, or the said agreement is not valid under the law to which the parties have subjected it, or failing any indication thereon, under the law of the country where the award was made, end of quote. From this clause, we may therefore derive two main effects. And these two main effects have also recently been summarized by the UK Supreme Court in the case just mentioned by Patricia, which is the Kabab GSAL versus Couch Food Group. And I quote from the, from the case, quote, Article 5.1a of the convention establishes two uniform international conflict of laws rules. The first and primary rule is that the validity of the arbitration agreement is governed by the law to which the parties subjected it. In other words, the law chosen by the parties. The second default rule, which applies where no choice has been indicated, is that the applicable law is that of the country where the award was made. Where the parties have chosen the seat of the arbitration, the place where the award was made will be or be deemed to be the place of the seat." End of quote. I therefore do agree with Patricia that where no choice of law clause has been included to the contract, it is only the natural way to apply the law of the seat. However, I would like to strongly advocate for the application of the law of the main contract to govern the arbitration clause where the parties have agreed to such clause. I previously indicated that we are only in this situation um, of perceived legal complexity and confusion because on the one hand, in theory, parties would be allowed to choose a different law applying to the arbitration agreement. But secondly, they do not explicitly do so in most cases. I do not believe that this argument adequately reflects the commercial reality and the party's intentions when they agree on a choice of law clause. I would like to object to the allegation that commercial parties regularly have the understanding and the intention that the chosen law would apply to the whole contract, except for one single clause. If I may quote from Redfern and Hunter, who also argue this, Quote, since the arbitration clause is only one of many clauses in the contract, it might seem reasonable to assume that the law chosen by the parties to govern the contract will also govern the arbitration clause. If the parties expressly choose a particular law to govern their agreement, why should some other law, which the parties have not chosen, be applied to only one of the clauses in the agreement, simply because it happens to be the arbitration clause? End of quote. To still argue the non-extension of the choice of law clause, we regularly hear arguments that have also been brought up by Patricia before, invoking the principle or doctrine of separability, according to which we may separate the arbitration agreement from the main contract. However, I would also like to rebut such argument because firstly, I do believe that the doctrine of separability does not have the purpose of necessarily excluding an arbitration agreement from a general choice of law clause. Instead, the main purpose of this principle is to uphold the validity of an arbitration clause despite its potential invalidity of the main contract. One could say it's a technical means to uphold the valid uh, validation principle that Maxi previously announced. 
Lloyd Justice Moore Big summarized this in the Sula America case, if I may quote, the concept of separability itself, however, simply reflects the party's presumed intention that the agreed procedure for resolving disputes should remain effective in circumstances that would render the substantive contract ineffective. Its purpose is to give legal effect to that intention, not to insulate the arbitration agreement from the substantive contract for all purposes." End of quote. And now we need to take a look on the party's understanding. And I do contest that the average party to a contract containing an arbitration clause is firstly aware of the doctrine of separability. And secondly, its potential implications on an agreed choice of law clause. And this was something the UK Supreme Court also recently considered in the case Anka versus Chubb, and I would like to quote, the principle that an arbitration agreement is separable from the contract containing it is an important part of arbitration law, but it is a legal doctrine and one which is likely to be much better known to arbitration lawyers than to commercial parties. For them, a contract is a contract, not a contract with an ancillary or collateral or interior arbitration agreement. They would therefore reasonably expect the choice of law to apply to the whole of that contract. From the perspective of my daily practice, I couldn't agree more. And of course, there are further practical and legal aspects for applying the choice of law. But right now, I would uh, summarize and conclude that I believe that it only duly re reflects the objective expectations and intentions of the parties to a contract to apply any agreed choice of laws clause, not only to the main contract, but also to the arbitration agreement, unless there are any clear indications that this was not the intention of the parties. Such interpretation not only gives due effect to the agreed and explicit contractual wording chosen by the parties, but it also adequately reflects the fact that commercial parties do not distinguish between a main contract and a separable arbitration agreement when they conclude contracts. To them, a contract is a contract, and a choice of law to govern the contract is to be held as such, and not as a choice of law to govern the contract except for one particular clause. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. So, um, thank you very much, Joseph and Patricia and Maxi for um, the very great um, exposition. Um, uh, we are at the 30 minutes mark. Um, I think we might have time for one question, unless Hafa tells me to um, move on to the second panel. Um, and I'll direct this to, well, the, the entire panel, actually, because I think covers all, all of uh, your expositions, which is, uh, so the question is, for the jurisdictions that have a clear answer, whether the law, the seat or the contract um, being applied to the arbitration agreement, if that particular law leads to the arbitration agreement being invalid, uh, would those jurisdictions also look at the validation principle? Uh, so that the arbitration is agreement is enforceable, or would they stick to their guns and say, "Well, we apply the law of the contract, and the law of the contract this is not this is not valid." Any takers? I, I, I'm happy to start, and I I think I can use my uh, typical lawyerly answer. It depends on the jurisdiction, I'm afraid. Um, because, I mean, this is not an answer that you can, uh, um, this is not a question that you can answer in the abstract. You need, of course, to look at the conflicts of law rules of the specific jurisdiction you, um, you're talking about. So if you look at, for instance, Switzerland, which I have given as an example earlier on, the answer is very clearly um, uh, that they will apply the validation principle. And the other countries' jurisdictions that I've marked in um, orange on my map, um, that will be the same. Um, it is less clear uh, in other jurisdictions. Uh, in, uh, the ENCA decision in, in the UK, for instance, makes an exception uh, to the law applicable uh, to the law of the to the to the application of the lex contractus um, if that law invalidates the. Um, arbitration agreement. And there is a second exception, uh, actually, if uh, the law chosen is, for instance, Sweden, um, which has, like uh, Patricia has told us, a specific provision that says, no, it should actually be the law of the seat. Um, so it is not like ENCA is a 100% uh, 
a clear solution for the law of the contract, there are actually two important exceptions, and that is the validation principle, and that is if the law chosen itself um, wants to apply the law of the seat. So I'm afraid uh, things are even more complicated. I would just like to briefly add that one additional argument that one may rely upon would be the most favorable nation principle to be found in Article 7 of the New York Convention, according to which it would be possible to still rely or argue the validity of the arbitration agreement under particular circumstances, irrespective of other choice of law clauses. And um, I agree, of course, with uh, Maxi and Joseph. And it, I think it's important to bear in mind, too, that if one takes a, a more traditional conflict of law analysis and start looking at things that which has the greatest uh, connection to the law, to the arbitration agreement, then you could also arrive to the seat. And that in some instances, when trying to determine if there is any indication of an agreement between the parties, that, that sometimes can come into play as well. But again, I think at the end of the day that all of us um, find that it's a bit um, challenging to have a situation that we now see in the kebab case where you have a challenge proceeding before the French courts, which is likely to find that the French law that applied by the tribunal found that the parties were bound to the arbitration agreement and the enforcement court finding that applying its law, that it is not going to find it bound, those parties bound in the enforcement. Of course, that makes minds run to Dalla, and there are some that argue it's the same and others that argue it's different. And that's something I'd love to go out and, and treat Maxi to lunch over and discuss. If, if I may suggest, I mean, one thing I have been wondering about, and I just wanted to bring this on the floor, we could all end this discussion immediately today if the institutions would opt to include uh, default choice of law clause for the to the arbitration agreements and no institution does that and so the question that i think is is would would be worth discussing is why why that is the case and whether we should change that i don't know we'll give any answer to that but i think it's interesting that we we find this colorful map on the on the continent then we say at the same time we have a very high level of complexity and of confusion, which parties do not really expect when they opt for arbitration. And at the same time, nobody's taking any steps to resolve this instead of interpreting it at certain levels of the and stages of the arbitration proceedings. I may add, there is a provision in the LCA rules uh, that actually deals with this. And it does not necessarily end the entire debate. Because just like the New York Convention, what it says is, unless the parties have sort of um, chosen a specific law, the law of the seat applies. But then you end up arguing again, what does this mean the parties have chosen a law? Do they have to have specifically chosen the law to the arbitration agreement? Or is it sufficient that they have chosen a law governing the contract? And then we're back to square one. Yes, if, if you have an open clause like that, if you would add to the default clause, the choice, like many, many institutions also have a choice of law clause suggested for the arbitration agreement, just a general choice of law clause. And if we would say the contract shall be, the contract, including the arbitration agreement, shall be governed by the following law, and then you could put the, including the arbitration agreements to brackets and leave the parties uh, open whether they want to strike this out or not, this would end the discussion immediately. I would think so, at least. That would be a suggestion. And the question is, do we want to suggest this to party or not? It's, it's an open discussion. I just wanted to mention this today because I was wondering why no institution would be doing this. Let me, let me just jump in and say, I'm not sure that that would end everything because we're going to move then on to the next question about whether that choice of law to the arbitration agreement related to the validity or to those other questions which Maxi noted. Are they also included? And what happens if it ends up leading to a situation where the law applicable to the arbitration agreement would provide for a result which is um, onerous or actually contrary to the approach of the law of the seat, which is hosting the arbitration. So hmm, I don't think that's going to solve it. It might push us down the road. Um, I think we still end up with uh, a war about uh, <laughs> the war. Yeah. So sorry to cut the discussion short. I'm sure we could be here 
four hours and it's still not be enough, but I want to keep the floor to the second panel to discuss the other issues. But uh, let me once again thank um, Maxi, Patricia and Joseph, and let me uh, give the floor to Jessica and to introduce the second panel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of the panelists and to myself for doing such a great job with panel one. Um, this now brings us to panel two with a new set of speakers. And uh, I will start with a very brief introduction of our three speakers. Um, none of them require an introduction and this introduction alone could take the entire session. Uh, so this is a very abbreviated summary for each of our very esteemed uh, panelists. Um, so first we will be hearing from Dana McGrath. Uh, Ms. McGrath is an independent arbitrator with more than two decades of experience in international dispute resolution. And in addition to serving as an arbitrator, she has experience as both in-house and external counsel, having worked at uh, numerous very large international dispute resolution groups before. Um, she's also the president of Arbitral Women, a fantastic initiative that I encourage everyone to look into. Um, and is on the Council of the American Arbitration Association International Commercial Disputes Committee. Uh, next, we will hear from Professor Franco Ferrari. Uh, Professor Rat Ferrari is currently part of the full-time faculty at NYU Law School, and previously was a chair professor of international law at Verona University in Italy, and a chair professor of comparative law at Tilburg University in the Netherlands. He has uh, published over 290 law review articles and book chapters in various languages and 25 books in the area of uh, international commercial law, conflicts of law, comparative law and international commercial arbitration. So I'm sure in your research, you have stumbled across some of his publications. Um, and last but certainly not least, we will be hearing from Samantha Rowe, who is a partner in the International Dispute Resolution and Business Integrity Groups at Debevoise and Plimpton based in London. Uh, Ms. Rowe has represented private clients and states across multiple jurisdictions all over the world uh, in arbitrations governed by various substantive laws, including uh, ICSID, oh, and uh, sorry, also conducted under various procedural rules, including ICSID, UNSA trial, SEAC, the ICC, LCIA, the list continues. Um, she's also on the steering committee of the American Bar Association's International Arbitration Committee and is a member of the executive board of ICDR, Y and I. So with that uh, brief introduction of our panelists, uh, we will start with the first question, which I will direct to you, Dana. Um, and the question is, assuming that you are dealing with a contract that is governed by New York law and that expressly carves out the application of the CISG, and assuming further that the arbitration agreement does not provide for the application of another law, how would you determine which law or interpretive principles apply to the arbitration agreement. Thank you, uh, Jessica, and thank you to the ICDR and to Greta Walters and to Raphael and everyone who's um, put together this panel. I'm honored to be a part of it. And um, I will offer some views. I don't know that anyone's getting crystal clear answers on uh, some of these issues, um, but that's that's part of the fun of our uh, our panel today. So um, just to sort of reiterate that the scenario that um, I am addressing is going to be different from the scenario that Professor Ferrari will be addressing slightly. Um, and that's an important distinction that will become clear as, as we address these issues. So um, I'm looking at the scenario where the contract provides for New York law and expressly carves out the CISG and the arbitration agreement itself does not provide for the application of any law or any other law. Um, and, and I think just to simplify it further, let's say the arbitration is seated in New York. So in this scenario, um, you know, instinctively New York contact, contract law generally applies to the contract and New York law contract interpretation principles uh, apply to the interpretation of the arbitration agreement as well. But um, it's more nuanced than that. And before we even go to the application or, or how you would um, tackle these issues under New York law, um, I think it's important to take a step back and consider that the US has both um, a federal system and a state system. So the federal and state legal system are intertwined. 
um, and differ in some ways and are similar in some ways. So some issues are governed by federal law and some issues are governed by state law. And I'll just briefly address the interplay of the federal and state law applicable to arbitration agreements. And this is a topic that would typically take much longer than we have. So it's really just to sort of put a pin in that issue as being different from what we're, we're discussing, you know, applying the, the substantive law to the arbitration agreement. Um, I think a, a helpful reference on this issue as to um, the interplay of um, federal law and state law and what is, um, you know, the federal law um, is the, uh, what we call the ALI, the American Law Institute Restatement on International Arbitration. I think it has a much longer name, but I think that that's enough for you to find it. If, you, if you're looking for it, it's generally referred to as the restatement. And that discusses the legal framework governing enforcement of an arbitration agreement, um, which is, uh, you know, sort of underpins the enforceability of an award, of course. And so the arbitration law governing enforce enforcement of, the, of an international arbitration agreement is, um, the relevant convention, namely the New York Convention or the Panama Convention, um, which in the United States, these are implemented in the Federal Arbitration Act. Um, and that is so that's federal law. Um, and any other applicable federal law, which might include case law interpreting um, the Federal Arbitration Act as codifying the New York Convention or Panama Convention or other conventions. Um, and also state law to the extent it's not preempted by federal law um, and that there's a chapter one of the Federal Arbitration Act um, that deals with domestic arbitration and chapter two that deals with international arbitration. Um, so that deals with um, interpreting an international arbitration for enforcement purposes. Um, so generally, in the first instance, it's often that federal arbitration law governs, um, and that's comprised of treaty, um, the Federal Arbitration Act, and federal case law interpreting it, and its implementation of the treaties, and other applicable federal law. And because we are a common law system, um, there's a body of Supreme Court jurisprudence and federal case law applying it that reinforces and applies the policies behind the Federal Arbitration Act. Um, and for the purposes of our discussion, um, we are not going to get into the choice of law rules, but depending on the applicable choice of law rules and rules of preemption, um, state law or foreign law may supply the rules of decision, um, but that is sort of going beyond the scope of today. So um, with respect to state law of arbitration versus state procedural law, um, both the state arbitration law and state procedural law may be applicable in state courts to the extent it's not preempted by the Federal Arbitration Act. Um, and that's typically where the matter does not involve interstate or international commerce. And that is quite frankly, not that often um, in our world of international arbitration, which is why you hear so much about federal law um, when it concerns uh, case law emanating from the United States on the enforcement of awards or interpretation mm -hmm. of the arbitration agreement. But suffice it to say, the Federal Arbitration Act does not entirely occupy the field. So um, that's with respect to enforcing arbitration agreements. But let's turn now to what law applies to interpreting the arbitration agreement mm -hmm. in our scenario where the parties have chosen New York law to apply without regard to conflicts of law principles. And the parties have expressly and explicitly carved out the CISG, which for US law purposes must be super express. Uh, so with very clear language to that effect. And the arbitration is seated in New York. So in this scenario, one would apply uh, New York contract interpretation principles to the arbitration agreement and the contract as a whole. I think applying it to the contract as a whole is 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 not disputed or really um, sub you know the topic of discussion. It's it's really applying it to the arbitration agreement 
even where the contract is silent as to its specific application to the arbitration agreement, the only law applied, only law mentioned in the contract is New York law. So if you assume um, it's a sale of goods contract, because we will be touching upon the CISG, um, with respect to the sale of goods aspects, some aspects of that would be governed by the New York version of the UCC, the Univer Uniform Commercial Code um, with respect to the sale of goods mm -hmm. and um, almost every state, if not every state, has uh, its own version of the Uniform Commercial Code and it really doesn't depart substantially from the Uniform Code. It just is, you know, has more letters to the acronym of uh, the New York UCC or the such and such UCC. Um, but contract interpretation principles um, are more found in general contract law than the UCC. Um, so for New York, like many common law jurisdictions, um, the basic contract interpretation principles emanate from case law and are applicable to interpreting the arbitration agreement as much as it would be the contract. Um, so then you turn to like, what are the, the fundamental contract principles, co contract interpretation principles that would apply to see whether there's a valid arbitration agreement, what does the arbitration mm -hmm. agreement provide? How do you interpret an arbitration agreement under New York law? And um, I think fundamentally from a New York law perspective, you look at the language of the contract, the plain language of the contract as the best evidence of the party's intent. And where a contract is clear and unambiguous, its terms govern. And you do not look at any other evidence of intent of the parties to interpret clear contract language. And that would apply as well to the arbitration agreement. Um, some people refer to this as the parole evidence rule preventing a court or arbitrator from considering the party's intent as evidenced in other documents or testimony to determine the meaning of a contract where the contract language is clear. So what do you do when the contract language is ambiguous? The arbitration clause is ambiguous. There, um, there's some room for consideration of the party's intent as evidenced by documents or perhaps testimony or drafts of the documents uh, leading up to or relating to the formation of the agreement. Um, but you do not look under New York law to evidence after the fact a contract was included. Um, you really focus on um, what led to the formation and the final language of the agreement. Um, there are various other basic contract interpretation principles that you would also apply. Um, one example is um, reading a contract as a whole so as not to render any provisions superfluous. You know, this probably wouldn't come up in the context of the arbitration agreement, but it might where there's different provisions in the contract dealing with different aspects of the dispute resolution mechanism. Um, so for our purposes, I think the key issue is that under New York law, the plain language of the contract including the, the arbitration agreement governs, it's given great weight and you don't look to other evidence to interpret it without some reason, um, some genuine ambiguity as to its meaning. And you look at, in that case, at evidence that predates the, um, the finalization or the execution of the agreement. Um, given uh, time constraints, I, I'll leave it there and turn it over mm -hmm. to our next panelist. Thank you very much. Um, so with that, we'll turn it over to Professor Ferrari and I would like to ask you to assume that the contract in issue did not cover out the CISG. Could the CISG apply to the arbitration agreement? And if so, how would you approach questions of interpretation? And I just want to know before you begin that I think your video might have gone out. Oh, let me see. No, I see my video. Now you we see, see it now? Again. Yes, thank you. Okay, and everything is okay, so I can go on. So, uh, as just mentioned, I will address a line of cases in which, for any of the reasons mentioned during the first session, the law applicable to the arbitration agreement turns out to be the law of a contracting state to the CSG and the parties 
unlike in the line of cases just discussed by Dana, have not excluded the CSG. So questions raised in this line of case are two. Does the CSG at all apply to arbitration agreements? And if so, what specific issues does it cover? Now, according to a paper published in 2019 by Alexander Fillers, case law, both, both arbitral case law, and I'm not only referring here, of course, to arbitral case law, but both arbitral case law and decisions rendered by states courts extend the applicability of the CSG's rules to arbitration clauses contained in contracts subject to the CSG. And some decisions not addressed by the Fillers paper, such as the Transmar decisions rendered in 2018 by the Court of Appeals of the Second Circuit, as well as the German Supreme Court decision rendered in November 2020, seem to confirm this practice. Now, part of the case law makes applicable the CSG's rules regarding formation of contracts to arbitration clauses contained in standard contract terms. This holds true, just to give a few examples, for the Filanto v. Kilevich Court, which applied Article 18.1, as well as the Spanish Supreme Court, which on several occasions, including in its May 1998 and February 1998 decisions, applied the CSG's requirements for standard contracts to be incorporated into a contract, an issue also raised both in the Transmar case, which I have just referred to, and the German Supreme Court's decision of November 2020. Professor now, Ferrari, I'm, to I'm sorry, Professor Ferrari, I, I'm, I hate to interrupt you, but unfortunately your video seems to have cut out again. Maybe we can give it one more try and then I'll let you proceed. Apologies again for interrupting. Yes, and I do not know why, I have to say. You're back. It, okay. it does. Okay, do you see me now? Uh, not anymore, but the substance is more important. So please proceed. Apologies again for interrupting. No, it's a, I apologize, but I do not know why this happens, actually. We were on call early and it did actually work. So sorry for that. Um, I was just saying that courts and tribunals do not always justify this, their decisions why they get to the CSG. At times they do, and the German Supreme Court did reason how it got to the CSG. The court, however, and this is important, applied not only the CSG's rules of incorporation of standard contract terms, but also the convention's rules on interpretation to the arbitration clause in dispute, as did, for example, the Transmar case and, and the Filantovi Kilovich court but the German Supreme Court did not apply the CSG's rules on form requirements, meaning the CSG's rules on freedom from form requirements set forth in Article 11 to the arbitration clause. And it is not the only one. A decision by the Frankfurt Court of Appeal from June 2006, while indeed applying the CSG's rules on incorporation of standard contract forms to whether an arbitration clause had been incorporated to the contract, did not apply Article 11 to the arbitration clause. Now, as regards the views expressed in scholarly commentary, they can be considered to fall into any one of three categories, which I refer to now. According to one category of scholars, which Phyllis calls rejectionists, the CSG does not apply to arbitration agreements at all. As stated, for example, by Stefan Kröll, one of the rejectionists, in a paper published in the Journal of Long Commerce in 2006, and I'm quoting, according to Articles 1 through 3 CSG, its sphere of application is limited to contracts of sale. Consequently, according to him, no one would apply the CSG to an arbitration agreement concluded as a separate agreement after a dispute has arisen or after the main contract has been concluded. Still, according to him, that the arbitration agreement is incorporated into a contract in the form of an arbitration clause does, according to him, not change its nature as a separate contract, as is evidenced by the doctrine of separability. Therefore, according to him, the question of whether the parties agreed upon an arbitration clause while being potentially within the scope of application of the CSG is outside of its sphere. Now, I'm not sure that one should use the separability doctrine as applicable under the Lex Arbitrary to determine whether the CSG substantive rules may or not 
apply to arbitration clauses or agreements, because this is clearly a CSG issue to be answered on the basis of the CSG itself. But also because, as mentioned earlier by Joseph, the separability doctrine does not really require that different laws be applied to the main contract and the clause containing the parties agreement to arbitrate. The separability doctrine merely, and I think this mirrors what Joseph said, states that the destiny of the agreement to arbitrate was expressed in an arbitration clause contained in a contract or in a separate agreement does not have to be that of the main contract. Thus, even if the latter dies, the main contract dies, the former may survive. On the other extreme of the spectrum of opinions, there is that of commentators sweepingly claiming that the CSG governs arbitration clauses as much as any type of clauses contained in contracts subject to the CSG. They base their views on the express references to be found in Article 19.3 and 81.1 to dispute resolution clauses. Now, these commentators even go so far as to extend, extend the applicability of the CSG provision on freedom from form requirements mentioned earlier to arbitration clauses, letting this provision prevail over any other provision on form requirements of arbitral clauses and agreements, including those of the New York Convention. In fact, one commentator even states that the other articles of the convention could also apply to dispute resolution agreements, including those for arbitration. Now, this view, in my opinion, cannot be shared. To the extent that the CSG applied as part of the law for contracting state, as in the line of cases I'm addressing now here today, the adjudicator should not disregard the conflict of convention rule contained in Article 90 of the CSG, which clearly gives precedence to more specific conventions, including, as claimed by many commentators, the New York Convention which for the purposes of arbitration clause, to use the words of Article 90, is an agreement which contains provisions concerning matters governed by this convention, meaning the CSG. And this view more specifically, the so one favoring the application of some, albeit not all CSG provisions to arbitration clauses, has been labeled the majority view in a paper published only last week in Internationales Handelsrecht by Stefan Kröll on actually the exact subject of today's webinar. But commentators do not agree on the CSG's rules that should apply to arbitration agreements and for what reasons they should or not. Most include the rules on formation among these rules that should apply. But there is difference of opinion regarding many others, including those on interpretation at issue today. For example, Ulrich Schröter and I in different papers suggest that the rules set forth in Article 8 on interpretation also apply to the interpretation of arbitration clauses included in a sales contract subject to CSG. Lucas Mistelis, on the other hand, considers this to be, I quote, unlikely. There seems to be more agreement regarding the fact that the formal validity is not subject to CSG's rules. According to Phyllis, also adjudicators seem to avoid elegant arguments proposed by scholars to justify their approach. The result is similar. In fact, the CSG is not applied to the formal validity of arbitration agreements, but is applied to their formation and interpretation. And uh, thank you for your attention. I hope um, that despite the video not working, and I'm sorry for this, um, you got the gist of my argument. Indeed, thank you very much. That was, um, it's quite a complex question. So <laughs> thank you for laying it out for us. Um, that was fantastic. And so I guess now this brings us to Sam. Um, and the question I would like to ask you is how, would the uh, would you approach the same question under English law? Are there any noteworthy similarities or differences that you think are worth uh, elucidating for this uh, for our attendees? Thanks, Jessica. Um, so English law today actually takes quite a different approach to the approach that's been outlined by Dana and by um, Franco. Um, the UK, of course, is not party to the CISG, so we at least don't have that wrinkle to, um, to contend with, unlike the United States. 
Um, and traditionally, the English courts actually would apply the usual principles of contractual interpretation to the arbitration clause in a, in a contract, as well as to the other provisions of the agreement, which are very similar to those that Dana has already described under New York law. So very much driven by the text of the agreement itself. Um, but as a result of following this approach, what we saw was um, English judges tending to draw quite um, fine technical distinctions between the use of different wording that we commonly see in arbitration clauses. So for example, there was one line of case law which held that a rising out of is intended to be a broader meaning, to have a broader meeting than the wording arising under. This all changed in 2007 when um, the House of Lords issued its decision in Fiona Trust and Privilov. And Fiona Trust is a seminal case under English law and it was really regarded as a fresh start, um, reflecting the principles of non-intervention, the policy of non-intervention and the fundamental principle of party autonomy found in the English Arbitration Act, which was adopted in 1996. Um, and what Fiona Trust did was it established what is called the one-stop shop presumption under English law. And that presumption is that the construction of an arbitration clause should start from the presumption that the parties are likely to have intended that any dispute arising out of their relationship is to be decided by the same tribunal unless the language of the arbitration clause makes clear that certain matters are to be excluded from the arbitrator's jurisdiction. So in other words, there should be a liberal broad construction of an arbitration agreement and the matters that it is intended to encompass, no matter the precise wording that is actually used by the parties to draft the clause. And the justification for this, according to the House of Lords, lies in the purpose of an arbitration clause, which reflects the party's intention to have their disputes, all of their disputes, decided by their chosen tribunal. And the construction of the arbitration clause must be influenced by the question as whether the parties, as rational businessmen, were likely to have intended that only some of the questions arising out of their relationship would be submitted to arbitration and others to national courts. And the House of Lords firmly rejected the technical distinctions that I described from the earlier case law. In fact, they went sort of a little bit beyond that. Lord Hoffman said that these distinctions reflected no credit on English commerce, commercial law. So the owner trust really drawing a line there, but it was picking up on language that um, you can find in an earlier judgment from Lord Hoffman in the West Tankers case, where he talks about um, the most important consideration is the practical reality of arbitration as a method of resolving commercial disputes. People engaged in commerce choose arbitration in order to be outside the procedures of any national court. That is the intention of the parties. That's what's driving all of this. And an important aspect of the autonomy of the parties is the right to choose the governing law and the seat of the arbitration according to what they consider will best serve their interests. Now, the owner trust has really sort of driven how the English courts interpret arbitration agreements. Um, and you see it, for example, in a recent case from last year, Terra Nerve, um, where the commercial court found that arbit an arbitration clause in one contract may cover multi-contract disputes, where the contracts are part of a package of agreements, so agreements between the same parties with similar subject matter that are interdependent and concluded at the same time. So again, just taking this broad liberal approach to arbitration agreements. I do just want to speak very, very quickly, picking up on what Maxi said about the validation principle under English law, i.e. the principle that the, a contract should be interpreted or a provision of a contract should be interpreted so that it is valid rather than ineffective. 
Um, Maxi referred to the 2020 decision of the um, English Supreme, UK Supreme Court in Enker and Chubb. That's the first decision where the English courts expressly recognize the application of the validation principle. There they were using it in a conflicts of law analysis to find that um, it may be that the conflicts of law analysis points towards choosing the law of the seat as opposed to the law governing the main contract if there is a serious risk that the arbitration agreement would be significantly undermined if governed by the same law as the main contract. Even more recently in um, Kebab G and Koot Food Group, which was just issued within the last few weeks by the Supreme Court, um, the validation principle was discussed again. In that case, the agreement provided for English law as the governing law of the contract, but the arbitration clause specified Paris as the seat of arbitration, but made no express reference to the law governing the agreement to arbitrate. So the question was whether English law or French law governed the arbitration clause itself. The implication of this was that under English law, there would be no jurisdiction over the respondent, so no jurisdiction over the dispute because the respondent was a non-signatory to the contract, whereas jurisdiction could be established under French law. And um, the claimant had essentially argued, we tried to rely on the validation principle um, to argue in favor of a choice of uh, French law, relying on the decision that I just described in Enka and Chubb. And um, what the Supreme Court said in that case is that the validation principle, again, recognizing its existence, said it's a principle of contractual interpretation. It applies where the parties to the dispute have agreed to resolve their disputes by arbitration. And it seeks to uphold this presumed intention that their agreement should be legally effective. And they said that what the claimant was trying to do in this case was to extend the principle beyond its proper scope. Um, the court held, you know, the court went on to hold that the validation principle supposes that an arbitration agreement has been made, which may or may not be valid, but it is not a principle relating to the formation of contracts which can be invoked to create an agreement which would not otherwise exist. Um, so I know we only have a few minutes left before we need to close, so I will, I will stop there, but obviously welcome any questions that the audience may have. Thank you so much. Um, we do have quite a few questions, but I think we only have time for one. So I'll direct it at all three of our panelists and uh, see who would like to speak on it first. Um, and the question is, is there any basis to treat standard terms clauses that are incorporated by reference differently when it comes to the question of applicable law? Or do you follow the regular course of choosing the applicable law as if it were a regular clause expressly written in the main contract? No, I think, as, I think this would have been or should have been addressed to the first panel, whether there is actually an implication for conflicts of law purposes in case of a reference. Um, as far as the CSG is concerned, of course, that is a completely different issue. It's a non-issue because as I mentioned, you get to the CSG only in two ways. The line of cases I addressed, which were carved out by Dana are those in which the CSG is part of the law applicable for whatever of the reasons mentioned during the first session. The CSG can be applicable even on different grounds if the applicable choice of law rules in an arbitration allows the parties to choose, I quote, rules of law as many rules do today. But then the issue is a non-issue. My answer would be, or my answer to whether the CSG can apply would still be the same, would not change anything. Thank you, Professor Ferrari. Um, unless Dana or Sam, you have any, any other comments to add, I believe we're actually at our time. But I wanted to give you the opportunity if you do want to jump in. Well, I think Professor Ferrari has, has addressed this, so I'm, I'm fine. Wonderful. Sam? I, I agree. Sorry, I'm trying to answer a, a question in the chat about the cases that I referenced, so I, I will try and do that before we, before we break. Thank you.
Yes, I think for those who can't see or haven't seen the chat, there's been a request for some of the authorities mentioned by the various speakers. Um, and I'm not sure who's best positioned to, to share that, but that has been asked to be shared. Um, so I leave that to the wizard behind the curtain. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, everyone. Rafa, did you want to wrap up? Uh, yes, I can just uh, conclude. And um, as uh, I think I put it in the chat, but uh, the recording will be available in our website. Again, if you, uh, it was, it's been posted a couple of times in the chat, but uh, if you look for ICDR Young and International, uh, we're gonna appear <laughs> first thing uh, in your Google search. And uh, with that, I just want to, again, thank you all very much for attending the webinar. Thank you to the panelists, the moderators, and uh, again, to Greta Walters for leading the organization of this event. Thank you all very much and have a great rest of your day. Thanks for the invite. Yes, thank, thank you, you for the invitation. Thank you all, bye. Thank you, goodbye.